being challenged this year, between two strangers can fulfill several categories if you're still looking. We have bookmarks with the categories on them uh, by the book sale table, so check that out later on. So if you don't know, Kate White is the former editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine and a New York Times bestselling author of psychological thrillers, including The Second Husband, which takes place in Westport. Uh, as she's also written eight Bailey Weggins mysteries and has also authored several popular career books for women. She's an editor of the Anthony and Agatha Award nominated The Mystery Writers of America Cookbook which I'm not sure what kind of ingredients, but I'm hoping that they're all edible. Um, tonight she's speaking with Gabby Coatsworth, who is also an author. She's written a memoir, Love's Journey Home, and a new novel, Just Out, A Beginner's Guide to Starting Over, as well as being a contributor to several anthologies. She runs monthly meetings for several libraries in the area, including the Westport Library. So without further ado, oh, wait a minute. We will have time for your questions um, after they have a little conversation. And books are available for purchase this evening. And she'll be signing them afterward. So now, without further ado, let's bring up Kate White. I'm so glad you let me know. <laughs> OK. I'm thrilled to be here this evening. Or maybe I'm in suspense. Or maybe I'm psychologically thrilled. Or maybe <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> I don't really know. So I wanted to know from Kate, you, your books have been published in several different categories. Can you explain? This is a suspense novel. Some are psychological thrillers. They're all quite thrilling, so I don't know what the difference is. Can you tell us? Well, suspense is really just the umbrella term for all types of, of books that I guess are supposed to scare the bejesus out of you. Uh, eight of my books are more mystery whodunit with a character named Bailey Wagons, but I've now written nine, well, I just handed in the 10th, but uh, what would you would call psychological thrillers, which are both uh, thrillers in the sense that the, character, the main character is in jeopardy, but there's a psychological aspect to it, and, but there are also whodunits as well. But all sorts of books that, you know, even something that would be like, yeah, like maybe even an international thriller might fall under the suspense category. Okay. And I can vouch for the fact that it's a very suspenseful book because I couldn't put it down. And even when I was trying to go to sleep, <laughs> when I rely on books to put me to sleep, I couldn't. So I'd like to know, having had a career in journalism, did that influence the type of book that you wanted to write when you started writing fiction? Well, when I was growing up, I wanted to write so many different kinds of things. I, I was a Nancy Drew fan. Any Nancy Drew fans here? Yes. Uh, I put out a, a magazine in my neighborhood and then a magazine in, in high school. I wrote a play that was put on in my high school. I, 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 I I just thought, I'm going to be all these kinds of writers. And it was only once I headed towards college that I realized you sort of had to pick a lane. And I ended up going to a college where my college asked me to be their entry in the Glamour Magazine Top 10 College Woman Contest. And so 
uh, this was before internships and the internet. So I thought if I enter and work really hard to win, that could be my ticket into magazines. So I ended up in magazines uh, by winning the contest. I appeared on the cover, which my brothers referred to as trick photography. Uh, but I, I always secretly wanted to, to go back to the lane of writing suspense fiction. And the problem is magazine journalism is all about telling and fiction is all about showing. So when I started writing my first novel, I really had to burn off the need to tell too much. But what did help me, I, I'd originally dreamed of writing a, a, a mystery about a, a female private detective, even before Sue Grafton did hers. But because I had no time as the editor of Cosmo, I thought I'll just make her someone who writes uh, true crime fiction for a magazine. So in that sense, it made it easier for me working in the magazine. I just borrowed everything that people did in front of me. I remember once this girl came in one day in the art department. She had this cute little outfit on, um, a you know, a skirt and a little jean jacket and a blouse. And then the next day, she'd obviously stayed with somebody that night and she showed up and she tried to make the jean jacket like her top. <laughs> I just thought, that's clever, I like that. You know, not easily fooled here, but that went right into the book. So. <laughs> Anything I saw at Cosmo, I, I, I tried to use. So that, in that sense, it made it easier for me. Well, speaking of putting real situations into books, have you ever wanted to get revenge on someone by killing them <laughs> off in a book? The first time I ever did it is with <laughs> the second husband, which takes place in Westport. I just, you know, once in a while, I, bo I, I certainly borrow from people I know and I do composite characters. But I had a first husband briefly and you might, if you knew him, recognize some things about him in this book. <laughs> Not enough for me to be sued, but uh, I've been married to my second husband. We just had our anniversary, I, I think two days ago and we've been married almost 40 years. So, but they say revenge is a dis best serve cold. So I waited a long time, but it, there was something just really fun about doing it. <laughs> we, we are being recorded, right? That's just another little fictitious thing <laughs> I'm saying. I just have to say that it's always the sweetest people <laughs> who've got the poison pens, you know. Um, all thriller and crime writers, women that I know, are just adorable. And their, <laughs> their books are sometimes terrifying. Not this one, however. Um, this one is a fascinating book to me because it's got a very unusual premise, not one that I've seen before. Uh, and it concerns uh, an inheritance that is left to an artist, a young artist in New York, who, and it's left by someone that she's never heard of, never met, and so on. What gave you that particular idea? Often, I would say almost always, I start my books with a little germ of something, and it might be a headline, you know, that law and order rip from the headline. Sometimes it is that. Sometimes it might be something I overhear. And often, by the time I get going with it, I've forgotten the nucleus. You know, it just kind of explodes into an idea. But in this case, there was something that happened in my family that led to the idea. Uh, my wonderful brother Jim is here tonight, so he will know that story. He lives in Westport. When our, our mother died a few years ago, it was you know, a devastating experience for us, and one of our brothers was the executor. And he's waiting for one of the IRAs to come in from my mother's you know, nice but modest estate. Uh, but she had a career, so she had some money. And the IRA doesn't come in, and finally he calls the bank and says, hey, um, you know, what, what's happened with that check? And they said, oh, it was sent out a few weeks ago. And he goes, well, I didn't get it. And, he, and they said, well, it didn't go to you. It went to, and they named a woman he had never heard of. So he gets us together, and we're like, 
did mom have a secret that we did not know about? Do we have a sibling that we have never met? Because it was a fairly substantial amount. And finally, one of my other brothers says, hey, isn't that the second married name of a many married person that we knew uh, who knew my mom? And we realized, oh my gosh, it went to this woman. So my brother was the executor, called her and said, did you get a check from you know, my mother's estate? And she goes, yes, I did. And he goes, well, what did you do with it? And she goes, I used part of it to renovate an apartment and the rest I gave to two orphanages. The old gave it to two orphanages <laughs> line. And he said, you know, how could you have done that? Because, you know, our mom had some memory issues towards the end. And she goes, well, your mother always said she really liked me. So we are we're really shaken by this because it is, you know, money that should have gone to us. We realize it had to have been something just confusing. My mother must have been confused. But then a couple of weeks later, the bank called and said it was a bank error. That they had her mother's name was kind of similar to my mother's name. They sent us the check. As far as we know, they never clawed back the check from her. So if you, like us, are a TD bank customer, you paid for that particular <laughs> mistake. But I started doing something that fiction writers often do, I've read, which is use the phrase, what if? So I started with, wow, what if my mother really had had another child? What if I got left money by somebody that I wasn't expecting? What if I got left money by somebody who I did not know who it was? And in this case, the character Skylar Moore does not know who the man is, Christopher Whaley, but she then finds out in the meeting with the lawyer, she begins to remember that it is a man she had a one night stand with 12 years before. And for those of you who might be my age, in, in the old days, if you had a one night stand with a guy, the, the most you could hope for is to be called Angel of the Morning. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, she inherits three and a half million dollars. And so a big part of it for her in the book is trying to figure out why he left her the money because the wife is coming after it and is going to try to get that money back and only in knowing why it was left to her, is she gonna be able to help herself? And in doing that, she uncovers other secrets about his family that become threatening for her. Yeah, so that's interesting. And I'm thinking that is why you had to have the 12 years before story and the current story. It's called a dual timeline, as most of you will know. I'm, I tried to write something like that myself, and I found it incredibly difficult to keep tabs on the ages of the characters <laughs> in the various... How do you do that? Have you got a secret piece of software <laughs> I could borrow? God, I, I wish there was software. I had always wanted to do it, but hadn't done a dual timeline. I've done uh, prologues that might be about the future or might be about the past. But what helped me, I think, was just you know, keeping a timeline as uh, in a Word doc. But I, I actually found it really stimulating to do because it kept my interest up in a way that, that sometimes it can flag after 17 books in the, in the middle of a book. Because when I would be done with one, you know, 12 years, the present, it would soon, every few chapters, be time to go back to the past, and I would find myself really exciting to go to get back there. What I had to do is be sure to show the difference in the protagonist um, because of what happened 12 years before. It was really upended her life. So I had to make sure I showed the contrast between her without making her a different person. Yeah, exactly. So did you write the whole... 12 years before part first, and then write what happened now? Or did you write them alternately? How did that work? I think I've heard of people writing them 
you know, in one chunk and then another chunk, but I, I took turns doing it. And I don't know why, it just felt exciting to do it that way. I think towards the end, I was really getting eager to finish the 12 years ago. And I might have cheated a little bit and written a couple of those uh, at once towards the end to get there because I knew what was going to happen. I always know my endings. And I try to plot out most of the twists in advance. But I was just sort of eager to get there and find out what happened to the sister, Chloe, who um, in the very beginning disappears from a party that she and her sister, Skylar, are attending in, Boston, uh, in the suburbs of Boston. So <clears throat> Skylar is an artist in New York, and you're, as far as I know, not an artist in New York. A very bad one, in fact. Yes, no, but that's fun. But how did you, did you have to research what it was like to be a starving artist in New York? Or how did, how did you know how to make it so real? Well, I, first of all, I used to live in the East Village of New York. And so I had a, a little sense of what that world was like. Most of my protagonists have had something, they've had jobs that have, things that I've been familiar with because of my work. In The Second Husband, the main character is a generational research and, researcher and trend forecaster. And I used one of those people my entire time at Cosmo, this wonderful young woman who I knew, uh, her mom used to be my boss, and she... I just relied on her because Cosmo was the first magazine I was the editor-in-chief of that I wasn't in the demographic. So um, I consulted with her on Gen X and Gen Y, and I spent a lot of time just thinking about um, what she did all the years we worked together. I also worked with a great guy, Joel Benenson. He did a big brand study for me at Cosmo, and he was the pollster that helped get Obama elected. And so he gave me some really great information for my book. With this, this is the first time I got pretty far away from anything I hadn't experienced with. But I, I collect art. I really love it. Uh, I, I, I just prowl galleries all the time in the city. And I have a friend who is not only a very good artist, but an incredible art forger. <laughs> illegally, legally, for those people who think, damn, I'd like a Mark Rothko hanging <laughs> in my living room, and he will do that for you, but not for $90 million. So he helped me a lot. And in fact, one of the really great things about writing are the people who are so generous and willing to share their information with you. Like my brother Jim, he drew, drew, drove me all over Westport, you know, to the Welk and to the Spotted Horse and uh, Spotted Horse, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all, isn't that what the nickname of? But, uh, and, and you count on people doing that. And can I just give a plug? When I started writing thrillers, a cop I used to interview to, uh, introduced me to a great forensics expert. And I, I loved uh, her, this woman, and we became really close friends. She was a death scene investigator for the medical examiner's office in New York. She went to 5,000 death scenes. And at Cosmo, I would do salons for my staff every six weeks. And usually the people came in might be people who talk about nutrition or relationships. There was no reason for Barbara to come in and talk about forensics, but she was invited back three times <laughs> because people loved it. Well, I pressured her to do a book, and I even threw out a title, What the Dead Know. It is coming out June 29th from Simon & Schuster, and it has just been picked as an Amazon book of the week. So... I'd love you to buy my book, but then if you could also buy her book too. And, and I think that's what's been really exciting, not just having someone help me with the art, but everything. People are happy to let you know what they know. Yeah, I think writers are very generous, and so are other people. So it's lovely that you've midwifed a book for somebody else. Uh, did you um, find that, Gabby, for yourself when you're doing your novel? Did you interview people for it? Well, actually, I, yes. So I, I took, I, in the novel I'm writing now, there's an egg farm. 
and I buy my eggs from the farmer's market every week, so I took the lady who runs the farm out to lunch because I needed to interview her. I didn't want to make mistakes about egg. I mean, I know nothing about egg farming. <laughs> so I took her to lunch at a, quite a nice restaurant, and I got out my card to pay at the end of the lunch, and they said, oh, sorry, our card machine is broken. And I had $10. <laughs> so she had to pay for my lunch. After, after I, she'd given me all this help. And now, every time I buy eggs from her, she's sort of like, well, how's the book coming along? <laughs> like, it's, it's coming along, thank you. But I, I paid her back, obviously. But um, yeah, so yes, but, but I found other, pe other writers are very helpful. And if I ask them to read my book and tell me what's wrong with it, they're very helpful, but they're very nice about it. Yes. One of the great things for me with this world is the tribe of other authors. When I decided to leave, my fabulous company, Hearst Magazines, and, and become a full-time author. I, I knew it would be different, but I had given them two years' notice, which they extended, asked me to extend till three. So I had plenty of time to get used to the idea. But I was thinking about this the other day. One of my first days working in my home office, it was on the third floor. We lived in a brownstone in, in Manhattan, and I'm looking out the backyard, and there is a red-tailed hawk in the tree right outside my window. I'm like, wow, but it is eating a pigeon. And I'm sort of like, God, this is so not the Cosmo fashion closet anymore. <laughs> but one of the things that makes it not totally just too cerebral is this tribe of amazing thriller authors. They are so generous. I think they feel it's a very big pie, so... I'm not going to lose anything if I tell you how, you know, what kind of advertising I did for this book. We just had International Thriller Writers Week last week in New York, and it was great. And I started doing this dinner party every year during Thriller Week, and I had it last Friday. And it was Karen Slaughter, Lisa Unger, uh, Chris Pavone, who wrote Two Nights in Lisbon, which you might have read, uh, Joe Finder, Lou Burney, Lee Child, and Al Fair Burke. And just as I was sitting at this table, with, I was like, wow, these are people who are friends now. And a couple of years ago when we had been eating dinner, I noticed that there were a couple of people, there were different pockets at the table, all talking about Ted Bundy. And I thought, God, I'm with my people, you know. <laughs> They all know a lot about Ted Bundy. <laughs> yeah. Dinner conversation, right? Yes. Not everywhere. Where else then. could that happen, right? Well, talking of, of characters, I have to say that I found myself suspecting every single character in the book, apart from maybe the main <laughs> character's parents. I was even suspecting the main character. <laughs> and right. I want to know how you did that, because I was quite disappointed that I got them all wrong. <laughs> Well, the great news these days is that readers will tell you they don't, they don't mind if they don't get it and they don't mind if they do get it because the challenge of the puzzle. What really helped me with misdirection was actually to read a few books on magic. Mm. And there was a woman who was, at, uh, she was a magician at several of my daughter's birthday parties when she was little. And um, just by coincidence, she became engaged to this wonderful woman who I knew some through another way. So the three of us went out for drinks years ago, and it gave me the opportunity to pick this magician's uh, brain a little bit. And she did a few things that night that were so terrifying. She read my mind. I'm sure she just planted thoughts in my mind, but it was just so chilling. But misdirection is fascinating. And, it, and I remember reading in one of the books that often the magician's already done the trick when he's telling you he's, by, by the time he's telling you he's doing the trick. So you learn with characters to create little things that misdirect your audience. Are there little slights of hand 
And you feel a little guilty sometimes when you're doing them, but that's what readers want. They want the challenge. Um, you also want to put down certain clues that are legit because you don't want your reader to feel cheated either. And so it's, it's trying to have the mix of both of those. Okay, so in romance novels, for example, there have to be certain elements that are included, like usually a meet cute, um, <laughs> meet cute. Uh, you know, a disaster that happens at 25% of the way through um, a, a huge fight somewhere else and so on, that people expect them and they get them, it's all good. Now in uh, mystery or crime or suspense, things, is there a requirement to include a certain number of clues and red herrings at certain points in the book? Oh, that's such a good question, Gabby, and nobody's ever asked that to me. Um, usually with mysteries, you, you use, a lot of people use what would be called like the, the two pillars or three act structure, and a lot of Mystery writers have told me they, they use a book called um, Save the Cat, which is a guide to screenwriting, and it became such a useful tool for authors. There's even a version now called Save the Cat Writes an, a Novel. But what's, what's key with, um, with thrillers is you want to have a great hook right from the beginning. And that might even be the first sentence uh, I, I just always remember that there was a Dick Francis book that started with the men wore rubber masks. Like, wow, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm hooked from the first sentence. But then you need very quickly, more quickly than you used to, an inciting incident. It's the moment where the, the protagonist is called to action. And I once heard somebody describe just give this as an example. It wasn't really a book, but a man's wife is murdered. And, and you sort of think, well, that's the inciting incident. Everything's going to change for him after that. But that's just the hook. The inciting incident is when the woman he works with tells him that she's killed his wife and that if he doesn't become her romantic partner, she's done enough stuff to make it seem like he will be the killer. Ooh. So now that's the inciting incident. That's his call to action. And there's no going back from that inciting incident. And then through the book, through the pillars, there are things that you want to have happen where it looks like all is lost. And then there might be a moment when the... the, the a protagonist gains some ground, and then there's sort of the final moment. And if anyone's interested in writing, I would say that definitely Save the Cat writes a novel, gives you a great idea how, how to do that, a lot of that. And in terms of twists and red herrings, that's really up to the author, but I think over time, you learn to pace it. You don't want so many that your reader is, you know, kind of like ricocheted. You you just try to feel it out over time. Mm. Yeah, that's, you make it sound relatively easy, <laughs> but I know that it isn't. Okay, I've got a couple of, of sort of general questions which I always like to ask people. And one of them is, do you have a book that you would never lend to anybody because it's too precious? Well, there are two, and there's one... Well, well there's two that I lent to people and was so angry because they never gave them back, but uh, one I actually recommended to Jessica, Je Jessica Knoll, who wrote Luckiest Girl Alive. Did you ever read that? Uh, it sold over a million copies. She worked for me at Cosmo, and I really loved her so much and believed in her as a fiction writer. And, and I had given her a list of books that I thought were critical to read, and Damage is one of them by Josephine Hart. It is such a fantastic book. And every time I've lent it out, I haven't gotten it back. And um, another book that I love so much 
that I've lent out, and it's very hard to get now, is called The Year of Living Dangerously. But the one I have never lent out is one of my favorite books, is called Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. It is, talk about mysteries. It is one of the most beautiful books. I cried a lot during it because we know so little about him. We only know things from uh, the records that were kept. We know he married a woman eight years older than him and she was with child. We know that he home again. But the this fabulous Harvard professor puts together things like gloves are mentioned so much in the plays that maybe for a while he, he worked for his father doing gloves. And it is a book, one of the great mysteries because this, this guy did it all and he did it brilliantly and not, AI will do it just as well at some point, but <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, for all of us writers. But I think if you want a, just a wonderful book, you don't even have to love Shakespeare to love this book. You just don't have to ask Kate whether you can borrow it. <laughs> yeah, please, no. It's not Because I, I will not loan this book out. So my last question is, are there other authors in different genres that you enjoy reading just for fun? Well, I do enjoy a lot of nonfiction. I usually try to have something nonfiction going at the same time as I'm reading other books. And often they do have a little bit of a mystery to them. I love Bad Blood about Elizabeth Holmes. I love Spare. I really did, I <laughs> confess. Uh, but I, I would say that my guilty pleasure our literary, is literary fiction where there's a mystery to it. Yeah. Like, I love Julian Barnes' sense of an ending, atonement. When you think of some of the really great literary fiction today, it there's a mystery at the heart of it, and maybe there's a mystery at the heart of all great books, too. I just read a fantastic book this um, this last month called um, The Go-Between, which was written in the 60s. And I think the New York Times It'll did something hotly. where they gave a free... Did they do that? They gave, they gave you a free Kindle edition of it. There's a mystery at the heart of that book that's so profound. It's just one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. And his first line, talk about a hook, is a, a line that even if you haven't read the book, you might have heard. The past is a foreign country. They yep. do things differently there. Yep. Yeah, it's a famous first line. Yeah. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question of Kate, please head over to the microphone, oh. if you don't mind, and um, because that way <laughs> we'll all be able to hear it. Let me just repeat the question. So the question is whether Kate has changed the way she writes. Is she writing differently now from when she first started to write fiction? Is that right? Yeah. Would, you rec would I recognize your writing in book 18 versus book one? Well, the characters now have cell phones. <laughs> I would say that I have really been required to pick up the pace. I remember years ago, uh, growing up you know, in the 60s, I used to love the show, The Fugitive, and there somehow I saw it, and it was so quiet. It bears no resemblance to the movie, and you realize, you know, just how much television, all those crime shows on television were forced to pick up the pace, and today you have to write faster, you have to write shorter chapters, you have to get to the inciting incident faster, like if you read Agatha Christie, sometimes the inciting incident might not happen to halfway through the book. And everything has to move faster. And so I learned that I had to do that too, keeping on top of what else is going on in the marketplace. One thing really I would say, being the editor-in-chief of a magazine like Cosmo, which we 
I took to number one in single copy sales and kept it there during my time is that I look at the mar I looked at the marketplace, I researched everything, I looked at data, and though you're always told, oh, write the book you wanna write. I wanna write the book somebody's gonna buy. So I do look at what's going on in the marketplace and I try to read, as Car my friend Karen Slaughter says, you know, read slow sometimes if you're an aspiring author. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they caught you by surprise at that point. And so I, I, I read slow with certain books. If there are any other further questions, please do come to the microphone so that we can capture it for the recording. And if you want to sing a little something while you're there, <laughs> we would be very impressed. Believe me, I'd clear out the room. <laughs> um, my question to you, Kate, is do you have a particular go-to, and I'm not talking about your editor, somebody that will give you the gut check when you write your first draft or your, almost your final draft, or I, how do you do it? That's a great question because I think Sometimes aspiring authors make the mistake of giving the book to their mothers to read or their friends, and that is just a terrible thing to do. You have to give the book to people who are writing the same, love the same genre you do. And so I use somebody who, she was an editor and she was an agent, and I use her just as a reader. And she'll tell me, you know, sagging a little bit in the middle, or I'm not getting this, or you're not bringing her to life enough. And I find that very helpful. Now, one way you can do that is through writers groups. I, I was in Cleveland last night, or ye yesterday, the last couple nights, and there was a woman asked about that, about trying to get a, a reader. And I said, I bet the library has a writer's group, and, and they did, and often libraries do. Um, does, does Jennifer, does Westport? Yeah, so that's a great way to do it, and you find people who are gonna be respectful, they're gonna get back to you on it, unlike, I, I remember once years ago when I was trying to write my 20s, I gave a, a book to a friend and never heard back, and of course I'm thinking, God, it must have really sucked. And then about 18 years later when she was moving, she goes, you know, I found that book you gave me. It was good. <laughs> Thank you, so my question is similar because I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during that dinner party last week. <laughs> so similarly, are there, um, you know, colleagues that are also mystery th thriller writers wh who will routinely come to you for your feedback or insight into their current draft? I would say that I, I'm not aware of that so much. I think there's a certain protectiveness even in this generous tribe. Uh, there might be some friends in those groups who do do that, but I would think Maybe not. Like, I would probably feel, like Lisa Unger, I love her. I don't know if you know her books. Uh, she wrote uh, Secluded Cabin, Sleeps Six, and uh, Confessions on the 745. Like, I asked her about nine months ago, look, what are you finding is really working now in terms of promotion? Because I like to stay on top of it. And she gave me some really great ideas. Um, but I probably wouldn't say to her, if my sales were dipping, hey, help me out here. I think that might just feel a little bit too much like you cross the line. But I bet there are writer friends who do do that for each other. Kate, you're so prolific. I think a book a year. <laughs> What's your daily regimen, writing schedule? Any insight for us on that? Well, what really helped me, and this is a great tip I would offer to anybody, I had a real procrastination issue in my 20s, and I would go, even though I wanted to write fiction, then I would go to these panels, like something like this, and invariably, there would be three or four writers on the panel, or it'd be one writer speaking, and they would say, 
if you're not writing, that means you don't want to be a writer. And I thought, I'm not writing, but I think I do want to be a writer. I would just tell myself I was going to write all Saturday morning, and then I would just never do it. So during my 20s, I was working as a young writer at Glamour Magazine. I interviewed a lot of people who um, were time management experts. In fact, one of them is someone that uh, Bill Clinton used, um, Alan Lakin, how to get control of your time in your life. But there was another guy named Edwin Bliss, and he t taught me this technique called slice of salami. And his point was, you know, if you see a big hunk of salami, it doesn't look that appetizing. But if you slice it, it becomes more appetizing. And he said that often the reason we don't do things we really want to do is not because we don't secretly want to do them, but because we make them too daunting. And you have to slice it up as thin as possible. And what's interesting is my yoga teacher uh, told me once, uh, she also does aerobics, that in January, you know, tons of people sign up for aerobics. And she said, the people who sign up for once a week are far more likely to be there in May than the ones who sign up for twice a week because they made it too daunting. So when I, at 48, I decided I'm running out of time and if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna do it. I was at Cosmo. I decided I would do the slice of salami technique. And I thought, what's the smallest slice that will keep me doing it? And I realized 15 minutes. Yeah. So for the first six months, I wrote for only 15 minutes a day. But over time, I wrote you know, more and more. And a big thing that I discovered too was that even though I was a night owl and stayed up usually to one o'clock, I wrote best in the morning. So I was like, geez, that's gonna be burning the candle at both ends. But I got up early to write. So. Uh, my routine now is to get up, try to be at my desk at 8.30, write all morning, and then in the afternoon maybe edit, where I'm able to, I'm not so much in the zone, but I can edit. And then, geez, you gotta spend a freaking, at least an hour a day on social media, which is just a big part of it now, whether you like it or not. Okay, I've got one last question myself, which is, you just turned in a book. If you'd like to tell us anything about it, that would be great. But if not, what are you planning on doing next? Because there's never an end to this, is there? You can never rest on your laurels. Well, I had a really liberating experience with my, I have a wonderful agent that I switched to about four or five years ago. And, and <clears throat> I'm gonna write the next book, which I'm starting in a couple weeks, about a woman who's older than some of the women I've been writing about. Uh, she's gonna be 49. And she suggested I start it in Uruguay because one of the reasons I did leave Cosmo is my husband and I had bought a home in Ur Uruguay uh, in about 2008, we did a lot of eco-traveling in South America and Central America with our kids, and we always wanted to live there. And so it, she said, you know, I think you could have part of the book take place there. So it's just gonna open there, and that's really gonna be exciting for me to do. And I feel it, it was great of her to think of a way of just ma make, making it have some freshness for me, and that's what good agents do, but um, so that'll be unusual. I'm so sick about writing women in their 30s at this point. That, uh, it'll be nice to get a little closer to my own age. Yeah, I know, that's, that's terrific. And I think having um, a book with characters we can relate to because we know them from around here, but setting them in, an, in a place that we don't know makes it even more fun for the reader. Yeah, and I think right now, I've, I've read a bunch of mysteries myself. There's a great one uh, called We Were Never Here, which start, opens in Chile. And I think there's been a little bit more interest in maybe some far-flung places. Do you feel that? Like, you know, instead of just it has to be in small-town America or something, you yeah. feel that? 
We had to run out of murders in Westport eventually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Kate, thank you so much for coming this evening and for being such a lovely interview, as they say. It was delightful and I learned a lot. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, so let's hear it for Kate White. And um, can I just say, first of all, thank you to the Westport Library. I, I remember my brother driving me by here, and there's a scene in the in the book where the character comes to hear an author lecture at the Westport Library. And I so appreciate actually having that I irony of now being the author. Uh, my brother Jim for all his help and love and devotion. And thank you, too, for letting me be a full-time author. It's I've, One of the great experiences has been interacting with the fabulous, you know, it's a lot of guys. Bill Clinton calls me up and says he likes my books, but it's, you know, the women who love thrillers and mysteries, and, and it's, it's been so gratifying to meet you all, and I thank you so much for coming tonight. And if, if you would like, um, if you would like a book for yourself or for a a friend of yours, uh, and you'd like it personalized and signed by our gracious author, she'd be delighted to do that right over there. And on behalf of the Westport Library, thank you all for coming out tonight. And I hope we'll see you at other author talks in the near future. Thank you all so much. Kate, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, no, that was fun. You made it very easy. You know what you're doing, so.